Hello, everyone, and welcome to Big Bad Con 2023 online and this amazing panel called Pitching Your Intellectual Property. I have some absolute media visionaries with me today, and I would love to introduce them so that we can get to the meat and potatoes that you're all actually interested in. Who would like to start? Austin, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, my name is Austin Taylor. My pronouns are he, they, she. I don't know what else I'm supposed to say. What do you do? Who are you? What are you what, what are you working on? I'm a, 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 I'm a game writer and designer and performer. Awesome. Cool. Sebastian. Hello, I am Sebastian. My name is, sorry, my pronouns are they, them. My name is Sebastian, as I said. I have worked for uh, full-time for Hitpoint Press since February 22. Uh, I'm pretty new to the publishing side of things, but I can give some insight into uh, what my employer looks for and what the process is like. Um, every publisher is different, and I can only speak to how Hitpoint Press works, but uh, I hope we can help today. Thank you. Carlos. Oh, uh, hi, uh, I'm Carlos Cisco. he, him. Uh, I'm a television writer uh, out in Los Angeles, um, most recently on Star Trek Discovery. And uh, I'm also a game designer. I've had stuff in uh, Arcadia and I have stuff in Fleet Mortals coming up and uh, Star Trek Adventures and a few other publications. Excellent. Banana. Hello, I am Banana, she, they, he, and uh, I am a game designer. I uh, also own and co-founded a small box board game and RPG publishing company called Game in a Curry, which we're now renaming to Read Only Memory because we're doing more uh, RPG type stuff now. Uh, I do a lot of contract work for various different companies, uh, such as Wizards of the Coast, Critical Role, uh, along with all of the work that I've done, which is my own IP, uh, such as John Shoot Blood in the Banquet Hall, uh, designed by myself and Sent Fulham. Super. And I'm Aaron Katanasias, he, him, I am the moderator. So let us dive in with question number one, and that is, how do you know which publisher is right for you? Uh, anybody want to go first? I, I can choose you, if so. Choose <laughs> us. Uh, uh, let's go with Sebastian. How do you know which publisher is right for you? Um, I have a couple of pieces of advice for this. Uh, the first would be to look at their catalog of products and their publishing values and see if they align with yours. Um, like if you think if you're uh, your thing might be similar to a thing they've put out, but uh, with enough differences that their audience would be interested, that is a good sign. Um, and in terms of um, like, also look at what you need and how well it matches what they can provide. There are a whole bunch of different things that you, that you might need. So publishing as in like bringing the product to market or uh, collaboration in terms of like writing, editing or art or design um, production, if you're making a physical uh, manufactured product. Uh, marketing, a lot of uh, publishers can help with that. Um, so, you know, crowdfunding, email marketing, like SMS, like that kind of stuff. Uh, unless, or you might just want to find a platform on which to sell your product. So like e-commerce and distribution and uh, wholesale. Um, some publishers also provide consultation. So these are a whole different um, list of services that go beyond just publishing that they can, prefer, that they can provide. Cool. Uh, Austin. How do you know which publisher is right for you? Uh, I'm trying to get something besides what Sebastian said, because Sebastian is so smart and so the right word. <laughs> um, very concise. <laughs> very con no, I mean, that's that's when you have a pro. I think mm -hmm. for me, it's knowing. I think when you talk about knowing, knowing if they fit your values, I think also knowing how they fit whatever public persona you might have if you're a designer it, that has a public persona. Some designers like don't use socials at all um, and don't have any sort of like public persona, in which case like that's kind of whatever. But I think knowing like if you like to tweet about like lawnmowers and the publisher has a rule that you can't tweet about lawnmowers, probably don't use that publisher if they don't mesh with the way you want to conduct your life in like a public forum. Um, even if your socials are like just yours, you don't really like promote your work on them, but like everyone can find you. Uh, I think it's something to be mindful about is how you are using any social media that is able to be consumed by the public. That is wise. It is. Banana? Yeah, I think uh, adding on to what everyone's already said, I think that looking at 
like a publisher's catalog of previous projects that is also helpful so that, that way you have an understanding of like what do they mostly look for right so in ttrpgs majority of publishers they mostly uh, look for books and so if you have like a game that has components that are more than just books like you know if you have meeples or you know um uh uh can't think of anything else cards right like uh those are also components that um that you sort of have to uh, take into consideration when you're looking for a publisher because the publisher that you're talking to might not uh be open to manufacturing cards or meeples or whatever uh what other types of components you have in your game so uh i would say look at their catalog and see what they do and finally carlos Oh God! Uh, so I think you know my my experience. I kind of come at it from the other side, um, being you know most of my pitching has been in another industry. But I think what sort of applies here is don't don't necessarily as you're prepping your your pitch, uh, don't be trying to chase trends that you're seeing happen like playing out in the marketplace because most of those things have been in development for months, if not years, and you're already behind. So just do what you're gonna do. And uh, you know, make it the best version of that possible as you're going into these meetings. And uh, I think that's going to you know help you once you're in the door. Sick. I like. <clears throat> Thank you for all being very informed and concise. These answers are ridiculously good. So I hope that everybody watching brought their notebook because I am taking notes. My next question is an important one because this is always like we've run this panel before, and it's the biggest one. It's how do you pitch to publishers? Like how, you know, what is step one to like getting this process going? Um, anybody want to go first for this one? I'll choose. I could start. I'll yeah. do it. Whatever. <laughs> um, I think uh, having a, a pitch deck that describes the vision that you have, uh, that's sort of something that's like vital. So I uh, was talking about this in the other panel oh. where uh, when you break down the steps to creating like a project, it's vision, strategy, and execution. And so the execution part is the hardest part. Let the publisher figure that out. Uh, for strategy, it's good to have like an idea of like what you want in the game, uh, how you want to make this thing, and how you plan to see this, you know, things come into fruition. And so having that in a pitch document is helpful. Uh, but what you want to ultimately have is the vision. So you're focusing on the vision in the pitch document. Um, and so that describes like, what is it like what is the in um you know film terms like what's the log line right for for this thing um and it could be like a, a quick like one to two uh sentence summary of like what your, the thing that you're making is uh and then just go into like what's the quick overview of the mechanics what's the quick overview of the world like um who is this for? Uh, if you have an idea of MSRP, like in board game worlds, they like to have an idea of that. In TTRPG land, I think it's less likely that you have to put that in, uh, but it's nice to have an idea of like how much you think this thing is gonna cost. Um, and anything like additional to add to it, right? Like what's the player count? Um, what's the age range? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so having that sort of like upfront in a pitch document uh, is always helpful. And uh, Sebastian, let's go to you. Uh, so uh, Hit Point Press is um, like we have a publishing proposal form where you can submit unsolicited inquiries. So it asks you to fill in basic information about yourself. So your past experiences, your information about your project, your goals, your timelines and how we can be involved. Uh, it also asks how your project aligns with our core publishing philosophies and why you'd want to work with us specifically and how you heard about us. And there is also a space for you to link to a sample of your project, which is really, really important. Uh, ideally, it would be something small, like a quick start or a chapter where you walk the reader through um, like your, your intellectual property and like what you are, like the game you are pitching. So it could be the kind of thing that you might hand out uh, at like a public, like at a, sorry, to the public at a convention or the kind of thing that you could put on a crowdfunding page as a download for folks to see if they like your product, like a kind of preview. Um, that's actually a really important part of the submission for us because we like to see that you like what you have and get a feel for the product and uh, having something to demonstrate what the idea is like really helps. And, uh, you know, as mentioned, it does work for public distribution and uh, crowdfunding preview. Um, so just having like a small kind of sample completed is uh, like my main point of advice there. 
uh, either of you two want to chime in or you want to Austin, well, Carlos? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think having, having a sample is maybe paramount to everything. Like if you don't have sort of proof positive that you can do a thing, nobody's going to let you do a thing. Um, but I also think, um, God, and I just had it in my head, um, along with, with a sample, you know, I, the, the, the answer that nobody really wants to hear is lateral networking because like the vast majority of at least my, my experience. So, you know, this is completely apocryphal, but um, that, that anytime I've gotten in the room with a publisher or gotten a pitch, it's been because of someone that I have met at my level that was too busy and suggested me. So, you know, I think that like really, you know, events like this, getting to go to Big Bad in person, other cons uh, where you can find, you know, your people and your peers and your collaborators, th those are going to actually get you in more more pitch rooms than anything, I think. Austin, do you have anything? Uh, I was going to say the only thing I would add <laughs> is like you have like you need to also believe in your project. Um if you are, I mean, so uh, Kyle's mentioned earlier, like not to chase trends, but like if you're trying to chase a trend or just trying to make a thing that you think like will make a lot of money um, and don't believe in your project, people will be able to tell. And it's not like, I can't speak to if a publisher will care or not if you care about it, but I can say it'll go a lot better if you have passion for your project, um, especially as you prepare if you get a bunch of no's, like if you don't have passion for it, you're going to end up not making it. Um, because it's, you might get the first pitch goes great and they give you a yes, but maybe the offer for your contract isn't great and you want to keep pitching around. Like it's it's a process. So you got to really have a lot of heart for it and be ready to maybe be pitching one thing for like a few months before you even get anyone to say yes. That has an agreement that fits with your values for your projects. Thanks, team. So say you already have a game. And you want to pitch it for other media like TV, video games, you know, but anything. Do you have any tips on how to do that? Networking. <laughs> I mean, like quite literally, that's the only way. Um, because if you are existing in a, an entirely separate industry and you want to get your game to, you know, producers and stuff like that, you have to meet them. So you have to go where they are or you have to hope that they are coming to where you are. Um, because I think like there's not really any other way to cross pollinate. I mean, Twitter was maybe once a good place for that uh, where you could, you know, find a producer online and send them a link to your game and, you know, they may dig it and then DM you, but oh boy, we'll see how long that lasts. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it really comes down to that. If you, are, if you are trying to pitch in other mediums, it's paramount that you meet people that work in other mediums because otherwise you're just, you're just yelling into the void. Anybody else? We can move on. That's totally fine too. But I mean, for me, I've heard all of you talk. And so I must say this, that like a lot of us in this panel work in different worlds and have done things together and worked on things and discussed this exact topic. So Carlos, you're exactly right where it's about not having not surrounding yourself in a room of people who all have the same skills. You need kind of a balanced party to make a tabletop reference in order to convert. Like if you want to meet, turn your game into a video game or a book, you'd have to meet authors and game developers. You can't just keep meeting other people who do the exact same thing as you. Yeah. And I mean, I think that as, as an artist too, uh, of any medium, diversification is the key to longevity. I mean, if you look at Banana, they're doing a bit of everything, mm -hmm. which is kind of incredible. Like uh, when I realized they were doing the paintings for forgery, I was like, why? Why Why is one person <laughs> so talented? It makes no sense, you know, like in that. But it's like you have to surround yourself with people who have different skills than you, just in the same way that I think like as an artist, it's, it's important to surround yourself with people with different worldviews mm -hmm. or to a certain extent. Um, you know, but who come from different backgrounds so that it sort of, you know, everyone kind of builds each other up. Yeah. And like all four of you said in your previous things, it's about having a vision and sticking to it. So even if it's not your thing, 
you still believe in it and you do it anyway, like making paintings or making video games and things like that. It's important to have a strong vision. All right. Why would you want to pitch your IP to other media though? Can I first note that I, there are things that I don't do for my yeah. games. Where don't, I just, don't like... believe, don't, don't believe them. It's, it's <laughs> don't, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Like performing uh, in an actual play. Is that one of them, banana? Oh yeah. You don't yeah. Do? yeah <laughs> you know, I've been, really I've good. been in two actual plays of your game. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to one. <laughs> Nice you know what's really good at actual plays though? Aaron's amazing. Um, no. yeah. This is about y'all. Um, but why would you want to pitch your IP to other media? Like, why do why does one want to do that? Does anybody want to does anyone have a strong opinion about that? Why you would want yes. to do this? Oh, Eric Carlos. You no, you go, please. I just talked a bunch. Uh, I was just gonna say, uh, like Carlos and I, we've been working on the screenplay for forgery. Um, and I think that like one of the one of the big things about um, trying to reach out to uh, trying to reach out to like other types of media is that there's two things, right? So the first thing is that you might envision it as something else. Like you might want to take like what you have and you probably have an idea of like, okay, maybe this would work in uh, a different setting, like video game format or like a, uh, a movie format, a TV format. The second thing is that, um, and I hate to say this, but the money. Um, <laughs> in TTRPGs, uh, we we make uh, a bit, um, not a lot, uh, but uh, if we were to reach out to like other types of mediums, then you know those mediums already have the structures in place where you can. Uh, sort of tap into it and uh, get royalties that way, license things out. Um, and yeah, I, I think that it's like a good vehicle for, for thinking about the longevity of your project. That said, it is not the 90s anymore. And I think there are a lot of misconceptions. Um, just it, it, And this isn't anything having to do with teach RPGs. This is like novelists and, you know, people in uh, musicians, other mediums. You know, they look at they look at Hollywood and they think, oh, someone's gonna just look at my cool product, justifiably so, and just give me a boat of money. And it and that did happen a lot in the '90s when there was money. Uh, you know, when venture capital was still kind of generous to people. Um, but these days, it takes a lot longer to get paid. Uh, the the margins are much smaller though they're still much better than tabletop but i think like uh one thing banana and i had a conversation about at the very beginning of the process when we were working on forgery was a uh, tempering of expectations because uh it, it's a it's a slow road out here so you know anything that you are trying to get off the ground out here be prepared for it to be a three five ten year journey alongside whatever else you're doing so the money, the money is a, a nice pie in the sky, but it should also be because you you look at your your IP and you're like, this is really cool. I would love an entirely different audience who would not look at an RPG book to also get a chance to see this work because I'm really proud of it. And I think that that's got to be sort of the the driving force there because yes, yes, money, but also there there also no money unless there <laughs> is, which there's lots, but most times. There's no money. So, um, yeah, that's uh, the other side of that, the, the money coin, as it were. <laughs> um, so, uh, did anybody else have anything for that one? All righty. So, what do you usually put in a pitch, Sebastian? Uh, well, content. So, um, like, what is your, like, what is your, the unique selling point of what you have? Uh, so, like, what's the hook? Um, you could, it's helpful to include, like, media touchstones. So, like, um, X, Y, and Z thing that has inspired what you have, but also um, just, like, ways that is different. That's not, like, yeah, like, just, like, you have to kind of um, emphasize, like, what's unique about it, but also, like, what will appeal to people about it. Um, and especially if you have like one central thing that, uh, that you think people are really going to love and get attached to and that they're going to really enjoy playing with. Um, it's also helpful to have information about your team. Uh, it's good to know who is working on, um, on the product. And um, like, it's also useful to have 
have details about your timeline and your process. Uh, it's less exciting, but it's necessary because then the publisher can, um, like, they can measure their capacity and line it up against what you need and uh, determine whether, like, you know, like whether they can help you um, and be useful to you. Cool. Anybody else have anything? What do you usually put in a pitch? It's fine. I'm ready to move on. I mean, I guess like <laughs> I mean also if you have like a finances breakdown, if you have that, so like where your money needs to go, and uh we can see if you've allocated like an appropriate amount of funds for different expenses associated with your project. Um, like and sorry, when I mean when I say timeline, I mean things like you know, when your when your like when your drafts will be done, uh when if you have a crowdfunding campaign, like when you want to launch. And uh, if you want to have physical products, like when do you expect those to have like to have those in hand? What I really appreciate about all of you talking about the, this pitch, this thing, is that it's not just a shiny thing. It's uh, it's not about like my brilliant idea. It's also like timelines and breakdowns and branding and marketing. And that is equally as important from what I'm listening to all of you as like having a great idea. It's, it's about execution. So Yeah, I think that is the part that needs to be like underlined more because if you're thinking about trying to pitch something you're some sort of artist. Like you, you, you have really cool ideas, probably 50 that you forget every day and 50 remember to write down somewhere in a Google doc that you forget exists. Um, and I think it's like really easy to have a really good idea, but it's very hard to think about how much time is this good idea going to take? And is, this, and then you have to decide like, is this good idea something I want to like run with before you, before you even get to pitching it, you need to sit down for yourself and be like, is this worth taking up possibly, depending on the scope of the project, anywhere from maybe only three months to like eight months or a year of my like of my life before it's even in front of anyone else, like before people even get to like get their hands on it. Um and I think it's a hard question to sit with to the side and you have to know yourself very well because like you're like if you're pitching it you're giving yourself the deadline like they're asking you they're like uh -huh. you want you want us to like take this thing we like this thing when when can you have it ready um and they might have an art they might have a deadline that like fits in their timeline you know that they give you but if if they ask you like when can you have it ready you can't just be like i don't know like you they they want to know like when's the first draft when's the second draft when's your final turnover like, do you need us to edit it? Do you have editors? Like, what's what are we doing here? Yeah, I think uh, piggybacking off that, I think the more questions you can kind of answer for the person that you are pitching to, the more professional and competent you seem and the more likely you are to get the job. And what I mean by that is exactly what, what Austin and Sebastian are saying is if you know sort of like production costs or, you know, the, the all the sort of non-creative technical stuff that um, makes all of our brains hurt, if you have done any of that legwork ahead of time, it just shows, oh, this person knows what they're doing. Even if I'm gonna have to be doing that work, I'm not gonna be needing to do it as thoroughly because they've already done kind of a pass on it. Yeah, I think going off of that, just having an idea of, um, you know, what should, what are the cost of goods sold in terms of like, you know, what you're going to be making, like having that prepared is helpful. Uh, ultimately, the, the publisher is going to come back with like, um, you know, a better idea of like what is going to happen with the product. Uh, but it is good for, you know, for you to like have all of that ready and present in the in the presentation as well. Um, I noticed that we did have a question about like, would you prefer a pitch document as a word file or a pitch deck as a slideshow? Um, and I think that the initial pitch should be like a slideshow. So like if you're having a presentation, um, like doing a presentation with the, the publisher, then it should be a pitch deck, but as a pre-read or something that's like a, a takeaway for the publisher, uh, I would ideally give them a, uh, a word file. That's just like a description of like everything that's going on. Here are all the details, uh, that we're probably not going to cover in the pitch deck because the pitch deck is going to be something that's like, this is pretty, this will draw you in. And here's like, you know, all the stuff that, that will go into it. Uh, but the pitch document itself, like the, the word file or like the, the longer document will go into the details of, you know, everything that you, uh, that you didn't get a chance to discuss in the actual meeting. 
So I'm going to hit you guys with a combo question. So first it's from the chat. And would you suggest pitching before crowdfunding for the project? Um, I would say that depends on what you need. Um, if you need support with crowdfunding the project, then absolutely yes. Uh, yeah. um, but if you but if you've already crowdfunded and you are looking for support for next steps, then um, and you just are looking for like you, you've basically done and you're just looking for like a venue to sell your your thing, then you can absolutely wait until after. But it really does depend on the exact nature of like the collaboration that you are seeking. Yeah, I agree with that. Um everything Sebastian said, because I think that um, like it really depends if you are looking for a publishing partner who's going to handle like the logistics and the shipping and the manufacturing, then, you know, that might be and you've already crowdfunded, then maybe that's like an avenue to go down. Uh, that would be more of like a co-publishing type of situation, because uh, usually a lot of publishers, they would handle like the crowdfunding and like the marketing and like all of that stuff for you. Um, I mean, it also depends on your deal, but usually that's what, uh, that's so sort of what it looks like. Uh, but then the percentages would be, um, you know, a little bit different. So like if they're handling a majority of the work with like publishing and all of that stuff, then percentages might look a little bit smaller versus like if you are um, co-publishing, it might be a 50-50 split or something a little different. Um, and yeah, it, it all depends on like what you're looking for when you're working with a publisher. Anybody else? Because I have a combo question that is, how do you, <clears throat> the important thing is, <laughs> a lot of us worry about is being annoying. So how do you follow up with them? <laughs> you know, after, once you've done this thing, it was, how do you... <laughs> it, it was so good to talk to you uh, last week, Thursday. I was just letting you know, um, that I enjoyed our meeting last week, Thursday, and I look forward to hearing from you soon. I hope your dog is doing well. I mean, moving on. Yeah, I was like about to say, I was like, <laughs> that is a template that you can copy pasta onto anything you want. Whatever, to follow whatever up. pet, they're going to mention a pet, remember the pet, and put the pet in at the end. <laughs> yeah, pet and or child. <laughs> Did anybody else have any comments? I hope that softball game you had to rush you went good. I hope they won. That was a home run. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, I think, like, to, to your point, I don't think that any of us are as annoying as we feel we are. And the, the biggest mistake we can make in follow-up is just to not do it because we think we're being annoying. And it's as simple as what Austin just said right there. Like, it's a form letter. Um, so it's just about doing it, you know, wait, like a uh, week and a half, two weeks. You don't want to be too eager, but don't text uh, back right away. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. not next day. Definitely don't do that. Um, um my, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sebastian. Oh, it's okay. Uh, I was going to say that um, if in the later stages of things, um, if you like say that you've had an initial meeting, then like up, like at the very end of that, you should establish like what next steps are and be like, okay, so next steps, we're going to do this. And then that way you can say like, hi, I'm just following up on this thing that I said that I would do for you. Here it is. Thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing from you and just to just kind of establishing those kinds of expectations ahead of the time when you have to follow up with them. Um, but it, in terms of the initial pitch, um, sometimes it's on the publisher to follow up with you. And so like, if they want to know more about your submission, then uh, they'll reach out to you about it. Um, so that is, you know, it kind of, it goes both ways in that kind of sense. So what happens if a publisher or licensor doesn't like your pitch? Their loss? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the next better person because that's really what it comes down to is like the best person for the job generally will be the one who's the most passionate about it alongside you you don't want someone who's lukewarm on your project because that's going to make working with them all the more a chore so you're suggesting shopping basically for, like yeah for, yeah yeah 100 percent. like do not should. do i don't if the you can go to your dream publisher for your first meeting and they love it. Do not say yes right away. Wait until you have meetings with someone else. Let them know like you're pitching it around and you're going to make a decision. Like part of them, like let them like, I'm going to make a decision month, two months. I don't make a number. Figure out that needs to be part of your planning. Like what's the number of like, when am I going to choose after these pitches? Because you, you might get more than one. Yes. And now you have to choose, but you have to choose what's right for you. And that means you need time too. 
it's not just this company because they have money like you matter too in this you have to make sure like you give that leeway and i think that's something that's hard for people because i feel like a lot of us like in this in this field are used to gig economy we're like i got i need i got i gotta pay rent i gotta do something but like when you're pitching your thing you're not like taking someone else's gig you didn't get hired to like write someone's monster they already made up they just don't want to write about it like this is your thing and you want to give this time because you don't want to rush into something and it's like oh this publisher that i thought was awesome actually sucks and i answering my emails i don't know what's going on my artist didn't get paid and they're leaving the project like everything's falling apart but i'm stuck in this contract now yeah i really agree with that because this is like this is your ip um like echoing what Austin said, like you have to remember that this is the thing that you created. And uh, I, I sort of think of it as like uh, applying to colleges or applying for a job, right? Like there are going to be some people that are very excited for the the thing that you're making or who you, uh, well, first of all, who you are and also the thing that you're making, right? And so um, some people are going to be more excited for it. Others are not. Uh, my go-to advice for anything is always just to like put eggs in all baskets and see what sticks uh which is probably like a i don't know that's like a weird metaphor but like yeah that's that's sort of like how i go by it Why oh, go ahead um, go ahead no no go ahead carlos go <laughs> this is a very small thing uh piggybacking off what austin said because suddenly when you have two yeses the thing that you have that you didn't have before is leverage in a negotiation you you know I mean, I don't know how often there are bidding wars in TTRPGs, but I can say that if someone someone has, you know, three offers on a project, they can then go to those different people and, be, and negotiate the best terms possible for themselves, as they should. Um, so, yeah, and that's all, just to add on that. Yeah, and I was going to say that in some cases, it's not necessarily like that they don't like your pitch. It's... Um, like sometimes they have limited capacity and it's not even like a personal thing if they don't respond. And sometimes it's just that they might not be able to work on your specific timeline or that they aren't the right fit for it. And uh, in those cases, um, like for me, I like to suggest other options or other publishers who might be open and available. And um, like, it's something that we are aware of that, you know, folks should be looking around for like the right vibes and the right offer. And so like, you know, to what folks have been speaking to, it is as much as whether you like the publisher as as much as they can, they're a good fit for you. It has to be a mutually beneficial thing. What I appreciate as an audience member listening to you talk, all of you, is this optimistic approach because it, it's it's tying into this theme about believing in your project of we didn't even address what happens if they don't like it because it's almost like that doesn't matter. Then you find someone else because there will be a fit for your thing. So don't worry about if somebody didn't like it, there will be someone who will, I believe is what you're saying. Well, also just like, if if you get to a point where it's just like, okay, maybe it's better for me to self-publish instead, because sometimes uh, like I've been in a situation where uh, there have been publishers who just don't like the thing that I'm making because it's like, it doesn't fit their wheelhouse. Uh, I just sort of think about like self-publishing. Yes, it's a lot of work, but at the end of the day, you believe in it and it's your own thing. And then once there is that proof of concept out there, like once the publisher sees it and they're just like, oh, so that's what you meant. Maybe there are like future opportunities for us to work together instead. Um, so even if like, you know, the publishers that you are reaching out to, where it's just like, you know, they just don't like it, like consider self-publishing, seeing if that works and then seeing if there are future opportunities to work with them uh, later on down the line. Love it. So we are at Q and A land. So I have a quick question for you. Should you slash do you include play test testimonials in your pitch deck? I mean, if you have them, then yeah. Um, it also does show that you have a thing that people can play, which is which is the most important thing about that. Um, like, it's great if they liked it, but also it shows that you have gotten at least some way to developing this, and that you're serious about it, and that you have the skills and the time to commit to it, and you want. And it demonstrates your willingness to put in the work. So yeah, do that. Yeah, I agree. I think with like. Uh with board games and card games, especially the standard now is that you should have a testimonial or you should have even like a video 
um, unfortunately, that's sort of like how how hard it is to like get uh, you know get your pitch decks together for um, for board games and card games now. But uh, yeah, like for them, like they really like seeing that um, so that, that way they can gauge like you know what is the player interest uh, for this game like is this something that they would like to pick up as well does it vibe with like the rest of the their product line uh, but for ttrpgs i think that sometimes the publisher will also ask for a play test and so you could play test the game with them um, and then they can take a you know take a look and see like oh does this fit with like our brand or you know our values uh, and the stuff that we make um, so yeah I would say those are helpful uh, but for TTRPGs it depends on your bandwidth maybe you could just do a play test with the publisher anybody else all right um, I mean, that's what we have. Does anybody have any other like last minute thoughts and things about any advice, any words of wisdom that they would like to just share about mm -hmm. this entire process? Because it is a lot of times, like once you've done it, it seems like old hat, like, oh, it's how you, but if you were like, okay, I have a question for you. What advice would you give for someone who has not done this before? Like one piece of advice each. Like. Like hasn't pitched before. Has I mean, never pitched before. Made a pitch deck, or it made a pitch, or and I, pitched. I'm going. I am going to say something that I know a banana is going to be like Austin. Stop, and that is <laughs> banana has a great YouTube video on how to pitch your product. It's like I think it's like nine or ten minutes. It goes through like putting together a pitch deck, shows you all the steps. It gives you the tools you need if you've never made one before to feel confident in making one. Highly, highly recommended. It's on Bananas YouTube. It's it's very good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just gonna go back and unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? So, uh... Yeah. Uh, well, I would say this is, and um, please like discount what seems like callous self promotion, but. <laughs> You should probably go watch the panel I did I uh, did last night on pitching yourself, because like truly more than more than anything, what you will be pitching out in this industry or any industry that is creative is yourself and your story. Because like yes, you will have a product, but more often than not, you're going to be meeting someone and they're going to be like, "What's your story? You know, tell me about you." And like a list of resume credits is not you. That's what you do that you need to be able to talk about who you are, what you do, and what you want to be doing. Um, so I, I would recommend watching it. We have, we have uh, you know, I, I'm fine. Everyone else is great. Um, so uh, yeah, um, but I think that that's like, it's, they, they go hand in hand, pitching yourself and pitching your product, because not only are you pitching this awesome thing that you've made, you're pitching yourself to work with that publisher for months to years. And they want to know that, you're chill or hardworking. Um, Sebastian, do you have an idea? I, I would say to uh, when you do it, to not be a. Yeah, um, I was going to say to not be uh, not be afraid of it and to just do it. Like if you put in your first pitch and it's bad, then like um, if you do it again and then like we're not going to remember. Oh, like that was the person that put in like the really bad pitch before. It's actually it's actually fine. I'm going to look at it and be like, oh, I'm excited to see what you have this time. You're going to try again. It's good to you know good to see it. So don't worry too much about like uh, being self conscious about it. Um, it's just it's just part of these publishers' jobs to look at different pitches, and so it, like don't kind of get all stuck in your head about it. So I'm I'm sure it'll be okay. Like, and once you've done it once, you'll learn a lot of like you'll just get better with experience. So each one's going to be so, better than the last one. The thing is just starting it. A quick question: What would you consider a publisher red flag? Uh, like. If they're not forthcoming uh, about specific things that you need to know, like if you upfront ask them a question that's like, oh, like how much of the revenue are we splitting? And like, you know, what's the percentage of that? And they don't want to tell you a uh, red flag. Like if like they should be forthcoming for like and give you as much information as you need to like work on the thing with them. And it doesn't actually do them any favors either to withhold that kind of thing. So if, you know, if they're kind of sketchy about like the contract and like the details of it that you, that um, are very pertinent to you that you need to make decisions. Yeah. Uh, if they publicly grant safe harbor to monsters. 
but not like the cool monsters, mm. like mm. the kind of monsters you like, but monsters with a capital M. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, some of the stuff is harder to find, but if you have a good network of people that you can talk to and say like, hey, uh, maybe you've worked with this publisher in the past, you know, what was that experience like? Uh, and just chatting with them about it, that would give you a better sense of, you know, if you should move forward with them or not. Mm -hmm. I have two. One, I think is like, if you can't find out anything about them, <laughs> not that like everyone needs to have every everything somewhere for me to find, but if like you, if you like can't, you don't know if anyone works with them, you can't find any of them on their website really about them. You can't figure out what they've made. Like that's like a, mm -mm, maybe you're real, you know, maybe you just don't know how to make a website. I don't know, but like, no, thanks. Uh, the other one I would say is like, listen to your, listen to your tum tum. If you get a bad feeling, like it's it's probably better to err on the side of caution and trust it. If something is off putting to an email that maybe isn't like egregious, but you're like, that's that's weird. Why would you say it like that? Like that's weird. Just like listen to yourself, and maybe it's nothing. But again, this is this is your this is your IP. This is your baby. You don't want to, you know, put it in harm's way. And now, I would like all of you. Well, I would like to thank you, first of all, for joining me. But I want all of you to take some ample time for shameless self-promotion and talk about who you are and what you do, if that's okay with... Because this is all, like, super... And I find it to be important for this exact thing because it's exactly what Austin just said, where it's like you want to find out who these people are and what they're doing, what they're working on, because it's important to know and see the actual product. So, Banana, who are you? Where can I find you online? What are you making and where can I find it? Yeah, so I am on a bunch of different social media platforms under Banana Chan Games. Uh, you can find my company, Game in a Curry, at Game in a Curry under a bunch of different social media platforms. I'm sure we have a few of them. Um, but uh, right now I am working on Forgery that's being crowdfunded. Uh, that is a solo horror tabletop role-playing game that uses paint by numbers where you're playing uh, a disgruntled and uh, jealous uh, art forger who gets commissioned to recreate a cursed painting. Um, so that is now live. Uh, next stretch goal that we're about to hit, we have like I don't know, like $600 left, I think, uh, is Austin's amazing game. So like once we hit that stretch goal, then uh, Austin and I will be working on that. If we hit 30,000, uh, Aaron will be doing the voiceover audiobook for the entire thing. I'll make it uh, hot. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and Carlos and I were working on a screenplay for it. So uh, if this sounds like something that you're excited for or interested in, then please do check it out. I'm just going to go around the call. Carlos. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I just ended my run uh, on Star Trek Discovery season five as a story editor, which is like a level two writer for non-TV normies. Um, uh, and uh, we, we just got canceled, which was sad. Um, but apparently marketing needs uh, an extra six months because they're marketing it as the final season. So you won't be able to see my episode until 2024 now. But in the meantime, I have... Um, I, I can't vouch for how good it is because I got rewritten, but I still have a story by credit on a giant shark movie called The Black Demon, which is based on a me Mexican cryptid, and it comes out at the end of the month. Uh, it looks pretty fun. Uh, it's people trapped on an oil rig while a giant shark tries to kill everyone because it's a giant shark movie. And that's about it. Uh, you, know, you can find me on Twitter at Carlos Cisco for however long Twitter lasts. Um... <laughs> We keep saying that and it keeps enduring, but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. Uh, mm -hmm. Austin? Uh, hey, uh, you can find me on Twitter and TikTok at Sailor Scott Austin. That's at Sailor SCT Austin because Scout's too many letters. And right now, well, I worked on To the Last Gasp from Darrington Press. That's out already. You can go buy it. Um, if you haven't already bought it, you can get it. I think it's on Darrington Press's website. And some retailers, it's not to like all retailers yet. There's like a there's like a map you can pull up on their website to find if it's like at your local gaming store. Um, and right now, I'm working on Kids and Capes. Look look for news soon. More news soon. Yeah. So make but, sure you follow Austin for all the stuff, so you know the sure. updates on all of these 
ridiculous projects that are so good. They're so absurd. You're all so successful and talented. In my eyes, success, the good kind, where I respect you and love you. Sebastian. Uh, yep, I've been Sebastian. You can find me over at Hit Point Press. Uh, I personally am on Twitter at Sebastian UA, so S E B A S T I A N Y U E. I also do do freelance uh, stuff myself. So uh, I'm a writer, designer, and editor. Um, I think that, like, in terms of like shameless plugs, uh, I'd like to highlight a Kickstarter called Guns Blazing. Uh, it's by it's a game by Bashir Gauss. It is his own IP. Uh, it is an example of. Like he is someone who went through the pitch process and uh, we're very proud to support the project. So it, we're really close to funding. So I'd love it if you, ch if you could check it out on Kickstarter. See, proof in the pudding about this process of pitching. That's a lot of yeah, plosives. It happens. Um, and I think that's all we have. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. In this. Oh, I'm Eric Tano Saez. You can find me on Twitter at Eric Tano Saez. I'm a voice actor and podcaster at the end. But thanks, everybody, for joining this lovely crew of people as they discuss a very important, but not at times discussed enough part of making the thing, you know, for monies. But yeah, and with that, I mean, I hope you have a great big bad caught online, you beautiful nerds. I hope you enjoy the rest of the panels and cool things happening. And that's about it.